Welcome to this Flame Guitars video and you join me today in my South London workshop. Now what I have here today is a Hagstrom acoustic, so that's a Swedish make and this guitar was made in the early 1960s. Now guitars are essentially wood and metal but for many guitarists they become so much more than that. They become special instruments uh, due to the memories attached to them and certainly for David the owner of this, this guitar who's had it since new that is the case. So let me tell you about David and some of his story and then you'll see why this guitar means so much to him. So as I said this guitar was made in 1962 and David bought it in 1963 and he tells me that he paid £63 for it. It was reduced from £75 because it had a a slight defect. Now at the time David was earning three pounds and fifteen shillings a week uh, which is what I call old money sort of pre-decimal currency here in the UK so I guess if you were to do the maths that maybe sort of equates to about five months salary so quite a considerable investment in the guitar at the time. And David tells me this Back then I played in popular local bands at many of the main venues in the Midlands, mainly supporting roles with many of the greats of the time, Tom Jones and the Squires, The Who, Manfred Mann, etc. And there were also various Melody Maker beat group competitions uh, with high spots at the, the London Palladium in 1966. And it was when he was at the London Palladium, the guitar was in its case and unfortunately someone stood on the case and cracked the the face of the guitar and I'll sort of show you that in, in a, a bit more detail. And then David's story goes on. In August the 9th 1966 I suffered a near fatal life-changing traffic accident. Intensive care for two weeks in the Leicester Royal Infirmary uh, and then he was transferred to the Leicester General Hospital where he spent the next 13 months or so undergoing further operations and he was in traction for 18 months. And David says, this guitar was my constant companion throughout my, my lengthy recovery, which, which went on for a number of years. But unfortunately, whilst he was in hospital, someone dropped the guitar and cracked the neck. The guitar was repaired, but as you'll see, it was not done very well at all. So I'm sure you can see why this guitar means so much to David. The memories attached to this guitar are both good memories and, and no doubt sort of painful memories as well, but also the guitar that, that was part of his recovery from this terrible road accident he suffered. So it, it's a real privilege for me to work on this guitar that David has entrusted it to me with all the memories that are attached to it. But let's come in a bit closer and look at this guitar in some more detail. So here is the guitar. And first thing to notice is this guitar was built as a right-handed guitar, but David is a, a left-handed player and he had this converted to a left-handed guitar when he bought the guitar. There is the, the crack along the, the top of the body with the, the tie I mentioned. And actually, once I'd had a look inside, I found that, that this crack had been glued and cleated, and it's it's not moving. It's it's very stable. So I'm just going to leave that as it is. Now the, the back of the guitar, you know, for a 60-year-old guitar, uh, is very good condition. Just looking at the fretboard, the, the, the frets are very low now. And uh, so I agree with David that we would re-fret re this, this guitar. So let's have a look at this neck crack that I referred to. The crack on this neck runs from there all the way through to, to there. There's another crack line along here and also 
another crack that runs to there. But when this was repaired, this part has not come together at all well, and there's quite a ridge just, just in that area there. In addition, a couple of dowels have been driven through, which are pretty un unsightly. And up and down the neck, there are quite a lot of bumps and, and cracks. So what I've agreed with David is that I will sand this whole area so it's smooth when you're playing and it feels un uh, smooth under the hand. That's going to expose quite a lot of bare wood with different color from, from what we're seeing here. So because the heel of the guitar is sprayed black, I'm then going to spray the, the back of the neck black and shade it in as it gets to the, the headstock, which will hide all these cracks and the, and the dowels. And cosmetically, I think will look a, a lot better. So first looking at the refret of this guitar, so what's quite typical for guitars of this era is that the, the frets are installed and then the binding is added once the frets are installed. So instead of running the, the fret wire over the, the top of the binding, and you, you can sort of see it, see it there. Uh, so I'm gonna replicate that process, but first of all, obviously what I need to do is remove the binding. Quite a lot of it is, is quite loose anyway, so it should come off relatively easily. just decided to adjust my technique and come at it from both at the top and the side. I wasn't sure how hard it would be to get these frets out. When frets are very, very low, it can be quite hard to get the, the nippers under the, the frets to start pulling them out. But these are okay. These are, these are coming out just, just fine. The frets haven't been glued in, so there's no need to heat the frets before I extract them. With the frets out, I'm able to do a, a proper assessment of the, the fretboard. The good news is that the neck is, is very straight. That's good. In terms of the fretboard radius, it's pretty inconsistent. So down this end of the, the neck, it appears to be 12. By the time we, by the time we get sort of towards the body end, it's definitely not 12. It's more like sort of 14 or 15. But it's better to be flatter at this end of the, further up the neck, um, and, and a greater radius this end of the neck. So almost what you might call a, a compound radius. Uh, the other factor to consider is there's a lot of ridges and unevenness on the fretboard itself. But that's part of the life and the character of the guitar. So I want to retain that as much as possible rather than just sanding all, all perfectly, you know, nice and smooth down, down to bare rosewood again. Just, just keep some of the, these ridges, but also 
just do enough sanding to make for um, a proper refret job so that the, the new frets seat well. So I'm going to sand along the fretboard, uh, probably sort of up to about 12th fret, just take out some of the, the humps and particularly the, the humps that I can feel over the, the edges of the, the fret slots just so the, the frets seat properly. So that's the refret largely done. A couple of points about that process. I started just by tapping in these early frets and by the time I got to about the, the fifth fret I just started to notice that the, the frets were just a little too easy to tap in. The, the fret slots were maybe just sort of slightly wider. So therefore I, I've gone back and I've run some water thin super glue under these frets and then from there onwards, I've then glued in the remainder of the frets. The other thing I would say is that I've had to do a lot of fret leveling, sort of particularly in this area here, a lot more than I would hope to do. Um, and that's because I've wanted to keep the, the character and the wear on these frets, which is sort of part of the life and the history and character of, of this guitar. So therefore, I haven't done as, as much fretboard preparation as I might ordinarily do. So a bit of a compromise there by not getting this fretboard properly prepared, but therefore keeping some of this, this old wear. That said, now these frets have been recrowned, they look uh, just fine, but they, they do need some, some really good polishing to take out the scratches left by the, the reprofiling tool. But now I'm ready to glue the bindings back in place. This neck now feels nice and smooth to touch. Uh, this area where I've sanded through to bare wood, I grain fill this area. And so I now need to spray sanding sealer over this area, followed by black lacquer. And over the top of the black lacquer, I will then spray clear lacquer. But before I do that, I just need to address the edge binding. 
So uh, I've just sort of sanded through the original finish on the edge binding. So it's now white in places and a sort of light yellow, the original light yellow in other places. So I just need to touch that up with my airbrush to bring it back to its original color before I move on to the, the next stage of the repair of this neck. This neck has been left for about two weeks now for the, the lacquer to harden and cure. And I'm happy with how this has turned out. The things I was, was looking for particularly was where I had a, a really quite severe crack that I repaired across here. To what extent has the, the fresh lacquer sort of sunk into that crack? And I can just sort of see it just there. Just a tiny amount of, of sinkage. I don't know if it's going to get any more than that, but I think that's going to largely disappear as I cut back this surface. I also think that my decision to spray this neck black has, has turned out well. Because it was already black in this area here around the heel, just taking the black further down the neck to hide all these ugly repair marks that were particularly present in this area here, that's, that's worked well. I'm also happy with the, the transition from the black to the brown. I, I did wonder about taking the black entirely along the back of the headstock, but I think that that transition looks good. So the next thing to do is to cut back this surface. There's a little bit of imperfection and orange peel in the, in the surface. A few, few marks, particularly around this area, but I'm not looking for a perfect surface. I think in a 60-year-old guitar, if there's some imperfections that are left in this neck, that's going to look a little more natural than, than a, a sort of perfect, pristine surface. After the buffing process, there are one or two imperfections in the surface, across there and across here, and certainly just along that edge there. 
I don't suppose a camera can pick those up. But uh, I'm absolutely happy with it without, as I say, I wasn't in trying to achieve a, a perfect surface, the cutting back process that I went through. I started at quite a high grit so that I didn't take out all these little marks so that it looks a bit more in character with a, a 60 year old guitar. And, and maybe if I was being generous, might look like a the original finish that has been given a really good polish rather than clearly a, a respray job. So now it's time to put the tuners back on and then put a, a new set of strings on the guitar. This repair is now finished and the guitar is now ready to go back to its owner, David. Incidentally, when I put the, the strings on, I found that whoever had changed this from a right-handed guitar, built as a right-handed guitar, to a left-handed guitar, they got the, the location of the saddle just right. So well done to whoever did that back in the, the mid-60s. This is a left-handed guitar and I'm a right-handed player, so I haven't really been able to play the guitar to see how it sounds, but from what I have been able to play, this sounds like a very, very nice guitar. So it's very, it's, it's great to have it back as a, as a properly playable guitar again, without that sort of awful feeling as you moved your hand up and down the neck. There's much I enjoy about the work that I do, both making guitars, electric guitars, and working on other people's guitars, but I've really enjoyed this repair. This guitar has a lot of history, a lot of playing in it, and means a huge amount to its owner, David. So it's been a, a real joy for me just to take this guitar, unplayable as it was, and turn it into a properly playable guitar again. And thanks, David, for having the confidence in me to work on this special guitar for you. Um, and if you watch this video, I hope you're happy with the work that I've done.